So, um, John Snow and the fight against cholera. Um, John Snow is the sort of one and only picture I know about on John Snow. So today, what we're going to talk about is John Snow himself. We'll have a, a little chat about cholera, but not too much because I think we've already flogged that to death. Um, I'd like to sort of talk about John Snow as an apprentice, then John Snow's grand experiment, and then also the story of the Broad Street Pump, and I think finally the sort of legacy that John Snow left us. So, introducing John Snow, um, he was born on the 15th of March in 1813 in York in England. Uh, he was actually born to William and Francis Snow in a, a little house in North Street. His father actually was, um, he was one of nine children, and his father was a labourer who worked at a local coal yard by the River Ouse. Um, so he came from incredibly humble backgrounds. Um, but what happened is his mother um, received a small inheritance that allowed her to send Jon Snow to school. And it was pretty clear at school that from a young age, Snow demonstrated an aptitude for mathematics. Um, so much so that at the age of 14, he uh, obtained a medical apprenticeship with William Hardcastle, uh, working in the area around Newcastle upon Tyne. Now, cholera arrived in the UK in 1931, and it seemed to appear around Sunderland and Newcastle, and also London. And so in 1832, during his time as a surgeon apothecary apprentice, um, Snow encountered co the cholera epidemic for the first time. Um, he was actually sent out to treat um, miners in a small mining village called Killingworth. And um, he was able to sort of treat a lot of victims of the disease and he, and he, he certainly gained quite a valuable experience by doing so. Anyway, um, that cholera epidemic subsided and John Snow in 1832 moved to London to commence his formal medical training. In the space of one year, he managed to complete his license to become a GP and a copacathy license, a bachelor's and a doctorate in medicine. And he also qualified to join the Royal College of Surgeons, the RCS, all in one year. And strangely enough, in 1850, he became the founding member of the Epidemi Epidemiological Society of London. So clearly, as early as that, John Snow had got ideas about um, mathematical calculations of the spread of diseases. He was interested then before he'd even proved um, the cholera links. John Snow, um, Actually, his, his main interest was, was uh, uh, anaesthesia, and he was one of the first uh, physicians to study and calculate the dosages used for ether and chloroform as surgical anaesthetics. The norm was, you see, anaesthetics, it was a little bit hit and miss. You gave somebody sufficient ether or chloroform to put them to sleep, and you just hoped that they woke up afterwards. <laughs> Um, he personally administered chloroform to Queen Victoria when she gave birth to the last of her last two of her nine children. And Snow set up his practice at 54 Three Street in Soho as a surgeon and a general practitioner. Now, this practice at 54 Three Street was actually just literally about half a mile or so from the, uh, the, the main cholera epidemic in, in Broad Street, which is what we're going to talk about later. And although Sir so John Snow's interest was in anaesthetics, he never lost his interest in cholera. And neither have we. So let's just have a few minutes to talk about cholera. Um, cholera is an infection of the small intestine by some strains of the bacterius vibro cholerae. Its symptoms range from none to mild to severe. And symptoms can start within two hours to up to five days after exposure. Now, the interesting thing about cholera is about 80% of the people who contact the bacteria don't really develop any severe symptoms. And the infection will tend to resolve itself by, you know, on its own. It's a little bit like having a sort of bad curry the night before, you know, the upset stomach, what we call the clonic comedy. But for 20% of the people who catch cholera, 
it is pretty devastating. And, uh, and this is a, a sort of London illustration of a lady who caught cholera and four hours later, she actually died. And it was quite common for this to happen, that people would die, become ill and die within four hours. People would literally just drop suddenly in the streets. Uh, it, was, it was quite a vile disease. It was known as a filth disease. Um, and if we look at the origins of cholera, um, it's, it's probably actually been around for many centuries abroad in places like India. Uh, and it was like sort of an endemic disease. It was, it was quite local. But it, 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 it became into prominence in the 19th century when a lethal outbreak occurred in India. So in 1817, this first cholera epidemic emerged out of the Ganges Delta uh, with an outbreak in a place called Jessore. By about 1820, uh, it had spread to Thailand and Indonesia and it had killed about 100,000 people on the island of Java alone. Now, this first pandemic died out after about six years and the likely, uh, it was a severe, the severe winter of 1823 to 1824, which may have killed the bacteria that was living in the water supplies. We're not sure, but that was, you know, that was just an, an assumption. Now, the second cholera epidemic, that began around about 1829, again from India, and it spread across the continent. By the autumn of 1830, it had now made its way into Moscow. And then the disease subsequently spread across Europe and including rich Britain for the first time via the port of Sunderland in late 1831. And as we know, by about 1832, it had reached the Midlands. Um, Britain enacted uh, several actions to try and help curb the spread of the disease. So we've heard all this expression, bad news travels fast. So we saw it coming just as we saw the coronavirus coming across from China, and we sort of tried to put things in place like quarantine, establishing local boards of health, uh, you know, and stuff like that. The problem is, is the public become just gripped with wide fear, you know, widespread fear of the disease. And they also sort of then, lo and behold, uh, a widespread distrust of authority figures, most of all doctors. Anyway, this third pandemic, you know, um, there was then, so there was an 1832 pandemic that reached and devastated the industrial Midlands, and we know quite a lot about that because of Sandfields. But there was then this third pandemic which arrived from, you know, an operating between 1852 and 1859, and this one was probably the deadliest. And this accounted for about 23,000 deaths in Britain alone in, the, in 1854, the worst single year of any cholera epidemic. Um, there was clearly an unbalanced press report in that led people to think that more victims died in hospital than actually died in their own homes. And there was also lots of theories about how to present cholera, you know, abstain from drinking cold water, whitewash the walls, don't drink spirits and beer, you know, behave yourself and God knows what. Um, and, you know, the public began to believe that some of the victims had been taken to hospital were being killed by the doctors so they could sort of do all this dissection work, you know, which had been prevalent a few years previous. Yeah. So, again, the, you know, people became incredibly suspicious and then it was pretty hard to sort of, you know, quarantine people. The other thing that was happening, of course, is, again, as with coronavirus, is people didn't understand the means of the disease spread. So the current theory at the time was it was spread by miasma or bad air or bad smells. And people believed now if it smelled bad, it was going to spread diseases. So that's cholera. So let's go back to the apprentice John Snow. So um, John Snow took an apprenticeship with William I. Castle in Newcastle at the age of 14. By 18, he was treating coal workers for cholera in Newcastle. Now, at the time, Snow was administering, administering the, the sort of normal things that doctors do. He would bleed people, he would give them opium, strong herbs, but he was finding it was not having any effect. The one thing Snow did try, though, was he tried rehydrating people with water. And that actually started to show signs of improvements, but people would become ill again quite soon. Yeah. Now, um, 
if you think about what Snow was doing, you know, he was trying to rehydrate people. He was on the right track. The problem is, he Snow, what, what he didn't understand was that when you get cholera, not only do you lose water, but you, you lose sodium and, and nitrites. And, and it's that's the sodium that is allows your body to reabsorb the water. Um, and so the, the, the common cure for cholera nowadays is to give people a combination of clean water, salt and some glucose. Yeah. And that then helps your body reabsorb water, prevents you becoming dehydrated. And then the, the, your body eventually deals with the cholera bacteria. Anyway, um, Snow kept meticulous journals and notes and noticed, he noticed that the mines were far away from the established places where cholera was normally thriving. So he thought something else was going on and that this was something that was transmitted more so from person to person rather than being transmitted through bad air. Yeah. Anyway, um, that uh, epidemic passed. Snow then moved to London and started to commence his, his career as a doctor. Now, in 1848, another epidemic returned to London. So what Snow did is he tracked down the very first case, the case what you call zero, or what we would call zero. And it was actually a sailor named John Arnold who had died. So Snow spoke to the physician who treated Arnold and he ought to find out this, this physician also treated another person at the same house in the same room eight days after Arnold had died and this second person had also died. And so Snow starts to think here that did this second person get infected by something you know either sod linen or something that Arnold had left behind in the house. So Snow also interviewed several people to confirm that cholera symptoms start in the abdomen so this certainly was not a disease of the lungs uh, and Snow would have understood that because of his research into anesthesia. The problem that Snow had, of course, was he was having to be careful not to upset the miasma de devotees who were going to just dismiss anything that Snow says differently. Now, what Snow needed was a grand experiment. He needed to find a way to prove this link. So he came up with this idea of a grand experiment. He was looking for a cholera epidemic. And he, he did a study on one street where all the waste water on one side of the street, and this is something like Alan Hill will tell you all about, you know, that people had open sewers in London, so the water, the sewers literally flowed down the gutter. And what he noticed was on one side of the street, the water sort of flowed downhill towards one of the drinking wells. On the other side of the street, the water actually flowed away from the well and then down towards the River Thames. And on the study, what he found was that um, all the people who lived on the side of the street where the water flowed towards the well, they all caught cholera. And on the street where the water flowed away from the well, uh, only one person actually caught the disease. So he still, so he thought he got his proof. But the problem is, is the scientific, you know, the scientific community were not prepared to accept it. So if I, um, if I just had to go over this little diagram um, what you'd got actually you see is you've got water flowing down the gutter towards a well and all of the people who've lived on that side of the street have become infected whereas on the opposite opposite street in the same road the water flowing away from the well only about one per person actually caught the disease yeah so what you can see is you know snow was a scientist and he used deductive reasoning he also got on his feet and walked around and started to gather information and he started to look for patterns in the disease so he could then sort of start to make predict predictions about the cause of the contagion. I mean it sounds to me like sort of snow was probably got a Spurgeous syndrome or something because he was pretty pedantic you know he he, he, he sort of looked at over 30,000 records at one stage he did and um, he was very good at spotting patterns so, 
Snow needed um, a grand experiment to link the spread of the disease to water. So we actually looked at the municipal records to show that in the district he lived in, uh, it had water supply by two separate water companies. Uh, there was a South Walk and Vauxhall Water Company and the Lambeth Water Company. Both of these water companies actually drew their water from the River Thames. Now what Snow found out was that the South Walk and Vauxhall Water Company was downstream of the sewers where the Lambeth and Water Company was actually upstream of the sewers. Because as you know, in those days, you know, the water ran down the gutters. It then ran into a very basic sewer system, which was just discharged, uh, you know, straight into the River Thames at the nearest point it could be. And it appears to be that, you know, the, the Southwark and Vauxhall Water Company was actually downstream of, um, of this water. So Snow, Snow saw an opportunity to do what we call an IB test to compare the infraction rate between the users of the respective water companies in the area that he lived. All good. So what Snow did is he wrote to all the local people and he went around knocking people's doors asking, where do you get your water from? Have you been ill with cholera? The problem he got was most people living in the supply area were tenants and did not know who supplied their water, you know, because they were just tenants. So Snow went back to the municipal office offices, he traced all the landlords, he wrote to them, he contacted them in, a, in an attempt to trace the suppliers. But also that started to become a little bit ineffective too. And that was because most of the landlords were just speculative investors, you know, they bought properties, but they sort of weren't really sure and didn't particularly sort of care either. So that didn't really work too well. So what Snow wanted to do is he started to look for a way to test the water. Now, when he sort of tested water directly from the South Walk and Vauxhall Water Company, he found it had four times as much salt as the Lambeth Water Company. And that was because, because the South Walk Water Company was further downstream, because the Thames is tidal, the Thames, as the tide comes in, it will bring salt with it, but that salt will sort of dilute out as it runs up river. So what you've sort of got, you see, you've got this higher salinity concentration at the South Walk Water Company than you had at the Lambeth Company. So you can now physically test the water. So what Snow did is he went back to the houses and he asked the tenants for a small sample of their water and that confirmed that 38 of the 44 deaths from cholera that month had come from the South Walk and Vauxhall Water Company. So you can imagine how popular snow was <laughs> with the water companies. Um, but certainly, you know, I mean, his findings there, you know, sort of led to this thing with the great stink and the basil jet and the improvements in public health and clean water and sewage, which, you know, is another story. Yeah. Okay, back to the Broad Street pump. So Snow was doing his grand, um, his grand experiment when it was interrupted because suddenly, literally less than a mile away from where he lived, where his practice was, there was this vast epidemic in Soho. And it just struck out the blue and it, and it, and it killed a lot of people very quickly. Uh, because Snow lived locally to it, he was able to sort of get out there as a scientist, walking, interviewing people with the local vicar, using deductive reasoning, and essentially looking for patterns, then trying to make a prediction of the cause of the contagion. And what came out of that was Snow's cholera map, or the death map, as it's called. And um, I think I've sort of showed this up a few times. So what Snow did was he, he marked all the cases of cholera, and then um, he, he started to connect it. And what he did is he, he created what we now know as a Voronoli diagram. I don't think Snow called it that at the time, but certainly he, he devised this. And what he, he was looking at is where was the shortest walking distance to the pump? Okay, um, welcome back. So um, I'm just talking about John Snow's death map. Um, so as I says, um, what Snow did was he plotted all the cases of cholera and he formed what we call a Voronoli diagram and was able to establish that the main center of the disease um, was this pump in, in Broad, Broad Street. Yeah, and it can actually sort of see all the, all the cholera cases marked. <clears throat> now, 
What you will notice is um, there is actually a Pompeia and a number of people near, who appear to be near to this pomp, um, who were also were cholera victims. <clears throat> but Jon Snow um, actually took that into account and interviewed people um, and actually sort of actually found out um, that those were part of an exception, which I'll, I'll talk about shortly. Um, if we just sort of close in on the Broadwater pump a little bit, as you can see, most of the cases revolving around Broad Street itself. And the pump that used to be on the corner of the street, right outside, which is now a pub called the John Snow. So John Snow found that nearly all the deaths had taken place within a short distance of this particular Broad Street pump. There were only 10 deaths in houses uh, situated um, near another pump, the one I've pointed out. But once, what's now found out by interviewing people is in five of these cases, the families of the deceased persons informed him that uh, they always sent for their water from the Broad Street pump because their local pump, the water didn't taste very nice and it was quite cloudy, whereas as the Broad Street pump was actually quite pleasant, sweet tasting water. So they prefer, preferred that water, yeah? Um, <clears throat> There were also three other cases where the deceased children went to school near the Broad Street pump, so they were taking a drink of water on their way to school, yeah. And then there were a number of deaths in the locality. Um, so, for instance, there were 61 instances that the deceased person used to drink from the Broad Water pump, uh, either consist consistently or just very occasionally. So, so Snow was able to conclude that it was this particular pump that was, that was actually contaminated. And hence um, the story goes, you know, that Snow asked the local authority to remove the pump handle. But that's not the sort of end of Snow's study because he was quite a sort of canny individual. And what Snow says was, well, for this study to work, you've got to make exceptions to validate it, or you've got to look at exceptions to these rules. So what Snow looked for was people who should have died, but did not, who lived in the area, and then those who should not have died, but who did. So near to the pump, there was a workhouse and also a brewery. Uh, the workhouse probably contained in excess of 300 people. And there was about 75 people working at the brewery. Very few of the occupants of the workhouse died and none of the brewery workers died. So Snow's investigation showed that the workhouse had got its own water supply and only a couple of the inmates were popping out to get water from elsewhere. So, so generally the, the workhouse stayed safe. And of course the brewery, the brewery workers were given a beer allowance every day. So they were drinking the beer only now, if you, if you imagine, I know people argue that um, it's the alcohol that preserves water, but actually, when you make beer, you boil the hops for about two or three hours. So anything that's boiled for two or three hours is not likely to survive, particularly bacteria reasons. So the water was actually being sterilized, so that's why the brewery workers were safe. So let's just take another look on that. So there's the work, so here we have the Broad Street pump. Here's the workhouse, so as you can see, um, occupancy between two and three hundred, but there was only about four or five fatalities in the workhouse. And by interviewing the workhouse staff, they found out that those people were actually going out business in the Broad Street pump. And then the brewery, again, no fatalities in the brewery because they were all having a, a lockdown party. Um, now, if we look at exceptions to the rules, somebody who died who shouldn't have died, um, Snow was informed again of a death occurred in Hampstead uh, at the West End on the 2nd of September. This was a widow of a percussion cap maker who was, she was age 59. Now she'd been, not been in the neighbourhood of Broad Street for many months, but what had happened is she was asking a friend or a servant to go and get her a bottle of water from the Broad Street pump because again she knew the Broad Street pump, she liked the taste of the water, so if somebody went and fetched a large bottle of water for her, and she drank it and she some subsequently became ill and died. So that's Snow's both exceptions. So shortly afterwards, um, Snow got the pump angle removed and that saw an end to the outbreak. 
there was sort of lots of years as well the outbreak was subsiding anyway um but certainly you know um it, it, it appeared to slow it spread the problem was his views were we still rejected by the medical establishment at the time and it wasn't really until um you know sort of germ 30s 30s started to become accepted which was you know 10 years later in 1966. So, you know, this is the legacy that Jon Snow left us. Um, the other thing is with Jon Snow is he had actually got quite poor health. He, he, was, he was quite a strange individual. He was vegan for a while, but he found out he, he was suffering ill health with his veganism. Uh, he would only drink distilled water. He was a teetotaler, but um, unfortunately on the 10th of June, 1958, he suffered a stroke and his condition deteriorated on the 16th of June. He was about 49 years old uh, and he died at his home at Icing Sackville Street, Piccadilly, London. Uh, and when they did a post-mortem, it, it showed actually that he'd also got advanced renal disease and pulmonary tuberculosis, you know, so he was actually quite, um, a, a, you know, an ill individual. Um, so there's a monument today to Jon Snow, which is they've erected a replica of the pump um, it's not in the exact same spot as the uh, the original cholera pump. Uh, it, it's a few hundred yards up the road and they still hold a ceremony. And there's also a pub named the Jon Snow where they do um, they, they do this sort of annual reenactment of Snow removing the angle to cheers and hurrahs. And then the council officials putting their pump angle back on to lots and boos of hisses. Um, there was a little bit of subsequent investigation about case zero, which is the, um, the first case of cholera in snow. -o. And this very first case was a baby, baby from a family called the Lewises. And they lived right next door to what is now the John Snow pump. And what they had found out is that the baby had probably caught cholera from elsewhere and had been brought home as it was ill and its mother was washing its nappies. And what they found is that this house had a cesspit and there was a crack in this cesspit and their cesspit was leaking into the well of the Broad Street, the Broad Water Pump. And therefore then it was infecting everybody else. Uh, when the baby died, the infection took a bit of a dip, but then the husband of the household became ill and then that started the cycle of infection again until he died and then the infection started to subside. So um, that's the story of Jon Snow and cholera. Um, I'll stick the questions up but I'll now come out of the screen so I can stop seeing everybody and perhaps if Chris can um, perhaps put the audio back on and um, any questions anybody's got I'll try my best to answer them. Was he a family man, Dave? No, no. Um, he was one of nine children himself, uh, but he didn't marry. Didn't seem to have an interest in girls. <laughs> That's why I says yeah, I think he was a bit of a strange character, mm. which may have accounted for why some of his theories were never accepted. I, I suspect, you know, he, he may have been autistic, you know, like Dr. Rin. Um, he certainly saw the world very differently to everybody else. Um, and you know I, I don't think he got a sort of an interest at all in family life mm -hmm. yeah. david there was yep. uh, there was another man who was um who he worked with who, yes. who was who did a lot of the statistics and helped out with the statistics i'm trying to think of his name because, that's, that's that's correct yes because john snow was father was a farm laborer i think farm life and he worked in the coal yard yeah yeah, and, and this other man was also from the north, and he was, I think he's, his father had been a farm labourer, or, or he did a sort of task right. right now. So yeah. they got on very well. And, uh, That's correct, yeah. Yeah. And, it, it's, it's one of those sort of things, it's, it's one of those sort of things where um, I was going to write you a short letter, but I haven't got the time. It's actually quite a big story. There yeah, are you, a number yeah. of other people involved, so... Um, yeah. Snow did a lot of interviews with the, the local vicar because everybody trusted the local vicar. Although, although at the time the vicar opposed John Snow's views about miasma, you see. However, 
after Snow died and when there was a further cholera epidemic and when the vicar started to do some research, he started, people then started coming round to Snow's views, you see. Yeah. So it wasn't, a, you know, immediately um, uh, accepting his views. Yeah. But yes, I mean, he did involve other people. He's quite open about that. And so when, when I do our, um, our cholera book and our John Snow book, I'll, I'll, I'll yeah. whack all that sort of detail in. There are a number of people, that's right. Yes. Yeah. 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 And yeah. you, you know you're talking about the Southwark and Vauxhall yeah. company and the Lambeth company and, and about yeah. the salt content because it was yeah. further down. I think yeah. also when they um, when when they started to re to sort of be able to separate the two, they found out that they could actually smell the difference between the two waters. You yeah, know, the Southwark and Vauxhall was a lot smellier than mm. the uh, the Lambeth company. You know, once yeah. they'd established that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, it, it was an interesting thing because you got two water companies, both feeding the same district, and the both of them have got water mines going up the same streets, but they were both separate water companies. Yeah, you know? yeah. That's right. David. Yeah. Wasn't there a problem with too much salt? Because too much salt is as bad as too little, isn't it? Yes. In your in the water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. The sodium. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes, yes. You get this reverse osmosis, don't you? Yeah. Yes, yeah. 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 Can Can I just raise a question? Sure. It's It's Robin. Um, I know. You know. I'm very interested in this. Um, this is the sort of politics and psychology of this. Yeah. Is that sometimes an outsider can bring illumination where other people haven't brought it, or can bring a practical solution. Um, yeah. It's interesting what you say about. Um, the use of chloroform and it yeah. wasn't until queen victoria decided to have it the establishment accepted that perhaps it was a good thing after all um and you know uh, it's it's perhaps um you know in previous centuries and probably in even in the 19th century there were places in this country where people would attribute things like cholera and infections to uh, witchcraft Yes, and 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 you know that was still still around. Um, yes, and, and and I don't know a bit nearer to home. Probably most of you will know about Darwin. Darwin sort of made his name within a fairly short time of coming to Litchfield. He didn't do very well as a doctor where he where he lived. He came to Litchfield, and he cured somebody who was uh, given up uh, as a hopeless case by all the other doctors. And it's really interesting that. Um, it's something that's nothing like success from breeding success, you know. Mm. And once you once you establish that, it, you can you can then get any sort of never look really back from that. But if that hadn't have happened, it might have been quite difficult for him to establish his uh, his credentials as as a, as a doctor. And then people would have you know perhaps not taken so much notice of other things that he did. Um, so I I suppose the, the the question is here is is do if somebody is qualified or in, in some way like that and then goes out and does something a little bit different, um, how do you get the scientific and medical establishment to listen to your results? You know, how do you, how do you get the, and you know, it's, it's really interesting what's happening at the moment with our coronavirus. You can think of examples there where, um, you know, there's the different, different opinions. We've probably come full circle now because people are saying, well, you know, the government says we follow the science. Well, the science is made up of different opinions. These aren't facts. They're but the balance of probabilities. This is the, this is the advice we, we're giving the government. And it's really interesting that um, perhaps he was working on his own, but, you know, it'd be useful to see what, as you say, whether we've got other people um, who were working on it, who also gave, came up with a similar, a similar sort of conclusion. Okay. Um, Sorry, that's of, more, more a comment than a question. Sorry. Right, well, the, I think there's a couple of good points in there, Robin. Um, first of all, what we've got to remember is that people's belief systems are not always based on facts, yeah? So people's belief systems are generally based on their ethnicity, their sexuality, their gender, their background, you know, their social upbringing, their education, there's lots of other factors that govern people's belief systems and they're quite often not based on facts. So well, you, you can sum that up by saying that people believe what they want to believe. Correct. Yeah. <laughs> so, 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 you know, what people believe does not necessarily have to line up with what you and I 
both theories the truth, right? Secondly, people create narratives of the past as a way to explain and understand events. So I'll give you, for instance, now, um, if you look at the Salem witch trials that happened in the 17th century in America, when you look at the evidence now about the way people were convicted, the way the evidence was gathered, the way people were hung and you know, executed, in today's standard, uh, you'd think it's absolute madness. Now, how could they have possibly got that, that wrong, right? However, at the time, people react to their local environment. And what was happening in Salem at the time is people were becoming ill, the village had been hit by a number of unexplained illnesses, which you could probably now explain in a way as maybe cholera, TB, cancer, you know, and all those sorts of things. But in those days, you know, we didn't understand germs, we didn't, you know, we, we thought it was miasma. So people create narratives to explain what's going on around them. And those narratives are not always based on facts because at the end of the day, there is a pure absence of facts, right? So in Salem, people started to think, you know, that strange unseen forces are happening. And then when you got this sort of series of events, you know, with a couple of children who started, who probably suffered from some sort of, you know, mass psychosis, it escalated into a whole state of panic. And if you think that now that we're cleverer than all that, you've only got to see what's happened already with this current epidemic in the way people have gone out and bought all the bloody title roll, you know. <laughs> and I don't know what sort of party they're planning on. <laughs> so, so, so can you see, and, and this is one of the things that I'm very interested in as, in an, as an historian, because people use this word, historical fact. And what I argue is there is no such thing as historical fact, because the past is a set of narratives that narratives, people perceive yeah, yeah. through their own culture, their own education, their own thought mm -hmm. processes. And so the past is as if. And we know that people cheat. We know that people forge documents. You know, people say, oh, but I've gone back to the source documents, yeah? But at the end of the day, also, I know all the anky-panky that goes on with documents, you know. I mean, according to the Daily Star, they found a London double-decker buzz on the news, you know, on, on the moon once, didn't they? There's some people who believe the Earth is flat. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, there's always a sort of argument, well, the Earth is flat, what's the problem? You know, apart from if you step on a piece of fat, you're going to slide off the edge or something, you know. But, <laughs> But, but it, it's about belief systems, and it's about that psychology. Yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah. And then what people do is they fill the vacuum. Yeah. yeah. And you you feed that vacuum, you know. And, they, and say this that, is, uh, that they say that history, you know, the word history, you can you can say is his story because it's yeah. it was usually a man. Yes. And um, it was written, you know, right. as a point of view, don't they? Join the Me Too movement, have it, Joe. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, there's a story, actually, Dave. It's interesting what you say. I think I've shared most of that. There's an interesting story about uh, a, a young man, a scientist, giving a, um, a, a lecture about the origin of the Earth and, and uh, you know, cosmology and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, afterwards, a, an old woman came up to him and said, you don't understand, young man. The Earth is actually resting on two large elephants. Yeah. He said, Didn't you know that? Who do, who do the elephants? <laughs> so he said, oh, do, really, said the young man. Do, what are the elephants standing on? Oh, wow, it's elephants all the way down. I mean, it's interesting because if, if you look at sort of deductive reasoning, so for instance, you know, again, you know, with, with Einstein and satellites and modern astronomy, you know, why on earth did people think the Earth was flat? In fact, the likelihood is people have never actually really thought the Earth is flat, you know, apart from now, you know. But, but generally, people have understood, in general, the Earth is round. However, there was this instance where people thought the Earth was at the centre of the universe. Yes. And everything revolved round it, yeah? <clears throat> and we, we look back and say, well, how silly, right? <clears throat> However, let, let's go through the logic. Um, people watch the sun across the sky, people watch the moon across the sky, people watch the stars revolve around the sky. So all the evidence was saying that the Earth yeah. was in the middle. The logic was right. See, the logic is right, it is. 
And it is relative because relative it is. Uh, the, 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 the binder was, of course, was the planet system because the planets seem to come across the sky, then they move back. Yeah. But the word planet means wanderer. So it's an object that wonders in the sky, so the planets yeah. do. Yeah, but I right. couldn't quite explain that, you know. Now, when you get to sort of Einstein's theory of relativity, it doesn't quite work, right? Einstein could not accept uncertainty. Einstein, you know, tried to prove that everything is calculable, yeah? <laughs> that every object, its course, its path is calculable. Unfortunately, quantum mechanics has come along and says, no, mm. it's not. <laughs> All right. now, what Einstein did to account for the randomness is he introduced an, an equation which he's treating. It was called Einstein's cosmological constant. Yeah? And Ooh. that explained away in Einstein's way the randomness, which, you know, again, put lots of Stephen Hawking's as, as now disc, you see. So people sort of, you know, they, they create a narrative to yeah. explain away what they can't explain. You're ever so close to the camera, Rob, and I can only see you one eye. Yeah. He's <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so got a lovely right here. Yeah, so, David, there's a very good little paperback book about, um, um, about all this, um, John Snow, um, called The Ghost Map. Yes. Little, nice little, you know, it's sort of very easy to read, but yeah. it shows, shows his diagram. Yeah. Um, because years and years before I ever knew anything about Jon Snow, we used to use um, his fault, his, his, you called it borrowed? I, I called it the death map, but it is, it's actually, he it would have called it the ghost yeah. map as well, yes. Because it's like the first, first uh, fault location <clears throat> diagram. You used to use it as a fault location diagram if you're teaching anybody. Oh, the fault, the fault and early diagram, yeah. Because yeah. It, it shows where things are. Because if you look in the sort of, uh, sort of maps, famous maps of the world and things like that it comes out as one of these because it's such a fundamental thing nobody would ever thought of doing that before yeah yeah you know, so it's sort of so it's so important um when i went there and wandered up um broad street because it's now it's 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 called broadwick street now they've broadwick, changed yeah. the name which I, I wonder why they did that yeah. um and you can see the john snow pub but i couldn't find the pump Right, so so the pump itself used to be right outside the pub, the pub. and it's marked with a red flagstone, ah, right? Yeah. So it's right out the front of the pub, yeah. But the replica pump is just down the road, and they had taken it away a couple of years ago because they were doing some building work. Uh, I think that's why I was there. Yeah, and they were going to put it back. Um, I mean, maybe, you know, I mean, I, they, have, they have this little ceremony, um, I think it's around about September, the John's Nose Society do. Um, maybe we've got to go for a little trip down there and have a point. Yeah, the I think they, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. On, on the Newsnight programme last night, they showed the uh, they showed an image of the pump, and I think they've got one of these blue plaques somewhere. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's all over yeah. London that, yes, that uh, sort of tells a little bit of the, you know, commemorates yeah. him and so on. Yeah. Mm, yes. But just mm. another, another yeah. little sort of anecdote, if you like, coming back to the cholera thing. Um, when I was, I've got an aunt who lives in London, and uh, when I was small, we went out for a walk once, and she, we, walked, we walked past this big, tall, probably 15 foot tall, cast iron pipe, and I sort of said, well, what's that for? And she said, it's a stink pipe. A and uh, pipe. it was used to, to ventilate the, uh, the sewers, sewers to get all this yeah. miasma oh, out yeah. from yeah. the sewers. I don't know yeah. whether that was right or not, but yeah. that's what she told yeah, yeah. me. Um, it's always she, stuck with me. She's, she's, she, she is actually correct that there are there are vent pipes. They're called they're called silent vent pipes, right? And yeah, in Birmingham, <laughs> um, in, in Birmingham, there used to be lots of them scattered around the city. Yeah, yeah. 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 And they were like a very very tall pipe, you know, probably yeah, about yeah. thirty foot tall, with yeah. like a little crown on the top and a cage. Mm -hmm. um, so so also it used to be vented. What what happens now is um, each individual household will have a vent. Yeah. Whereas before they didn't, and so they used to actually vent the sewer mm -hmm. on these regular mm -hmm. vent pipes, right? Mm -hmm. um, but nowadays, building regulations say you either have a vent pipe or you have a Durgo valve. Yeah? yeah. Now, in Sheffield, and there also were some in Birmingham, I remember them, in Sheffield, because Sheffield's hilly, you tend to get these pockets of methane gas at the top of hills. 
Mm. Yeah. So what they did in Sheffield is they installed these William Suggs sewer gas destructor lamps. Mm. Right. Yeah. So what these lamps were, they were like a stink pole. They were hollow. And at the top, there was a, there was a gas lamp. And there was about six mantles in the gas lamp. And this gas lamp generated heat, which actually broke down the methane and drew oh. the sewer gas out of the, the mines, the sewers, you see. Mm -hmm. and, the, and there's still some of those in Sheffield that still work. Wow. Um, there, there used to be some in Birmingham. Um, there used to be one in Station Road, Erdington. Um, there was an, like a little island. I've got a picture somewhere. Yeah, there is. Island. Yes. Um, bottom Station Road and Gravity Line. Yeah. Uh, there was a sewer mm -hmm. gas lamp there, but they were built by William Suggs. Mm. So, um, so, yeah. Oh, wow. okay. so yes, sewers are vented, yes. Is it, yeah. At least what I think it's still there, there's one off the Strand in London. Yes, the there Savoy, is. Because, Farthing uh, Line, isn't it? Yeah, there's a it's book. In far, it's, it's in Farthing Line. A print, there's a book called The London Nobody Knows by Jack yeah. Jeffrey Fletcher. That's when right. I, so, when I moved from London, I, yeah. I, I, I travelled around a lot of the places that he talked about. It was fascinating. Yeah. I saw this. I'm, I've never checked since. It may still be there, of course. No, it, it is still there. It's in Farthing Line because when I told the, uh, the stepdaughter to go and have a look, I says, go and have a look at the lamppost down Farting Line. Yeah. <laughs> so the gas lamppost in Farting Line. Is there. <laughs> yeah. no, but it's, it's actually Farthing Line. <laughs> yeah. I guess you've got to be careful where you throw your cigarette end, haven't you? Sort of cigarette <laughs> end and... Well, uh, one, one of the problems with sewer gas explosions were, was... Um, they would blow these heavy duty manhole covers off. Mm. Now, I know we've all seen the sort of little light duty manhole covers you have in the garden, which weigh probably about, you know, I don't know, 25 kilograms. But yeah, these road right. ones, you know, like the ones outside Sandfields, how heavy are those? About 100 kilograms? <laughs> Imagine one of those going flying through the air, you know, <laughs> with a sewer gas explosion. It has happened, and people have been seriously injured with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 There, was a, there was a very, um, very bad case of that in uh, Wigan, in one of the pit yards, and they got an old shaft, and they'd put a concrete pad on the top, it weighed about 28 or 30 tonnes, big reinforced pad, but they left a small pipe up the middle to vent any gas that was there, and right. some guy was walking across the road, I think I've across seen that. the pit yard with his mate, having a smoke because he'd been working, I'd finished the fight, flicked it, and it, it, by sheer chance, it just got in the fight, went down, and there was an almighty bang, and it lifted this huge 25, 30 ton of concrete, lifted it and dumped it about 20 feet away. Yeah. It such, you know, it's just for me then, you know. <laughs> It's, it's inter interesting you know, with the you know, with the cholera with the, the water supply. When I was working a few years ago on the boats out in America, engineering, the lengths we would have to go to um, to protect the water supply on the boats, um, obviously for the guests, yes. and because it was such a hot environment, um, algae and bacteria growth was so it would almost be so easy to start it going. And we used to have a major problem with the the water that fed the reverse osmosis pumps for the fresh oh, right, water. Okay, yeah. If you've ever smelt stale seawater, mm. it's horrendous. Mm. So the it gets us basically rotten eggs smell. Yeah. Sulfur content. Uh, hydrogen sulfide, yeah. Hydrogen sulfide, yeah. And if mm. that smell got into the boats, into the bilges, it would, it would, I mean, it would get anywhere. And if the guests smelt it, it was just a nightmare. It was horrendous mm. to get rid of. Well, you use hydrogen sulfide in uh, stink bombs, you see. Mm. Yes. Yes. I was I was um I was the school by chemist I was. I had <laughs> I had, I had a chem my mother bought me a chemistry set when I was about twelve and that was it like you know <laughs> so fine gas. Yeah. yeah brilliant stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. I bet you've one of these boys that dropped bangers down the sewers and blew the street up. <laughs> Almost. Oh, yeah. 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 oh yes. yes. I certainly had my moments with bangers, I did, yeah. Well, calcium carbide and water, that's the best one. <laughs> it does, yes, that's right, yes. Oh, carbide yeah. bond. Yeah. Yeah. And, and sodium chloride and sugar, you know, and potassium permanganate and glycerine. <laughs> <laughs> I've no done all those. Down the wells at Sandfield. <laughs> oh, well, well I, I've, I've done all those. I blew the sand pits up, you know, that fetch the police to me and everything, you know, and I blew the sand yeah. pits up, yeah. yeah. So, Brilliant. Yeah. Well, some of the kids from the last war had uh, used to get the old 303 ammunition. Yes. 
and the concrete fencing posts that used to fit nicely in there, used to push it in there and hit the ah. hammer. Yeah. <laughs> they lifted to tell the tale, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 There was plenty of misspent youth during those times, I know that. <laughs> Well, it's interesting, as you know, we've got the same people now going over the years of today, like, you know, and actually being there, but done it like, you know, already. Yeah. That's how you learn, pass it on. Pass it on, yeah, that's right, yeah. Right. Okay, anybody else, any more questions about John Snow, cholera, history, psychology? Yeah, it was about the... Uh, 1939, 1932 epidemic, you got on the thing, I think you got the date wrong. You know, 19, oh, uh, so should it be 1932? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll have a look at that. I mean, it's, it's at the moment, it's funny, you know. Yeah, okay, fine. Yeah. Right. So I'm confused, I'm easily confused. <laughs> okay. Thanks for that, Brian. Yeah, I, I, know, I did notice as I went through it this morning, there was a couple of typos, like, but, um, you know, did it, did it sort of tell the story okay? Yeah. 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 Brilliant. Yeah. Oh, good. Okay. So we'll, 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 I'll, I'll whip that into, it might be worth doing two publications, one about cholera uh, and one about, um, about Snow himself. I've got, I've got an interesting little book here, funny enough, um, that was actually written um, within a year or two after the Bilston cholera epidemics. So that is very similar to John Snow. It's, it's um, hand accounts of, 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 of the cholera in Bilston. Mm. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna have to love love you and leave you, everyone, because we're going out going out on the bike ride and little man. Okay, Chris. Uh, little yeah, man's getting right. a bit itchy, so nice yeah. to see you all. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again. Thanks again. Yeah. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Yeah. Um, okay. Any 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 more questions? Mm. Any. Just any wonder if um, I saw a slip of the tongue, almost slip of the tongue that you made, David, made me wonder whether, whether they could have uh, renamed the uh, area in which all this happened, Snow Hope. Snow <laughs> <laughs> it, it, It's a shame, really, because he was a little bit like, you know, nobody appreciated it until after he'd sort of died, you know, that mm. he had been made. Um, there was this, this general resistance. But then again, that's not new. Edward Jenner, you know, with, with vaccination, uh, there was resistance to that. And part of that was commercial guy, you know, some, some of the doctors were making a fortune out of variolation already, you see, so they didn't want things to change. They didn't want this upstart coming along, you know, and saying, oh, I've got this instant cure, you know, sort of dirt cheap, you know, it's going to cost tops, you know. Yeah, bleach. Um, all sorts yeah. of things like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know. <laughs>